Table of Contents, Newfoundland and Labrador. All about Newfoundland and Labrador. With visiting and touring information, geography, history, attractions, and other points of interest. Dr. Sidney Socloff. Dr. Sydney 22 at gmail.com. 2022. Narration by Dr. Sydney Socloff. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Coltov. For a more complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to this video using the link here. Chapter 1 The Province of Newfoundland and Labrador Where is Newfoundland and Labrador? This shows the location of the Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador at the far eastern edge of Canada in North America. Newfoundland and Labrador is a province of Canada composed of the island of Newfoundland and the lower mainland sector. Labrador to the northwest. Newfoundland and Labrador is Canada's newest province, joining the Confederation only in 1949. Its name was officially changed to Newfoundland and Labrador in 2001. Newfoundland and Labrador is the most easterly part of North America. The position of Newfoundland and Labrador on the Atlantic coast gives it strategic importance in transportation and communications. This is the Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Newfoundland and Labrador are separated by a narrow strait called the Strait of Belle Isle. The capital and largest city of Newfoundland is St. John's on the Avalon Peninsula. The island of Newfoundland lies next to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It is separated from Labrador by the narrow Strait of Belle Isle and from Nova Scotia to the southwest by the Cabot Strait. Labrador is bordered to the west and south by the province of Quebec and on the east by the Atlantic Ocean. This is another map of the Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador. The great fish stocks inhabiting the Grand Banks to the east and south of the province are very important to the economy. These fisheries have been the single most important factor in shaping the history and character of the land and its people. This is a license plate of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. This is the provincial flag of Newfoundland and Labrador. The Newfoundland and Labrador provincial flag bears some similarities to the Union Jack. The white is for snow and ice, blue for the sea, red for human effort, and yellow for self-confidence. The blue areas suggest the importance of British heritage, while red and yellow in the shape of a golden arrow stand for the future. The red-bordered white triangles refer to the two main parts of the province Newfoundland itself and the adjacent mainland territory of Labrador. Other symbols reflected in the abstract design include a trident emphasizing dependence on the sea, native Indian ornamentation, a maple leaf, and the Christian cross. Here is the population of the provinces of Canada, going east to west. The total population of Canada is 38 million. The total population of Canada is 38 million, about the same as the state of California. Ontario is the most populous province. 
with a population of 14.8 million. Quebec is the second province in population with 8.6 million people, although it is the largest province in area. The province of Newfoundland and Labrador is in ninth place with a population of 521,000. Population growth was rapid until the 1990s, when emigration increased. Periods of economic recession since 1970 have affected the province, notably in the 1990s when depleted fish stocks in the Grand Bank significantly reduced fishing activity. In recent times, significant increases in tourism and the discovery and exploitation of rich offshore oil and gas fields have significantly boosted the provincial economy. Chapter 2 This is the island of Newfoundland. This is a view of the shore of Newfoundland. This is the fishing village of Francois on the south coast of Newfoundland. Chapter 3 The History of Newfoundland The island of Newfoundland was named the Newfoundland by 15th century explorers. The official discoverer of Newfoundland was the Genoese Venetian navigator Giovanni Cabotto, better known to history as John Cabot, who reached the island in 1497 while sailing under the English flag. The fisheries of the Grand Banks doubtless had been known to fishermen earlier. John Cabot's enthusiastic reports opened the way for regional international rivalries. Early in the 16th century, English, French, Basque and Portuguese fishermen contested for catches. By 1600, England and France were the chief rivals for Newfoundland. Several colonization attempts during the 17th century met the hostility of the English fishermen and, after 1634, of the English crown. In 1699 Parliament prohibited settlement of the island except as necessary to maintain the cod fishery. This restriction remained the primary governing directive for Newfoundland for more than 150 years. The French founded Placentia on the southeast coast in 1662 as a base of operations. From Placentia, the French destroyed every English settlement in Newfoundland in actions that took place in 1696, 1705, and 1708. Treaties in 1713, 1763, and 1783. The last marking the armistice ending the American Revolution recognized British sovereignty but granted French fishermen the right to land and dry their catches along portions of the northern and western coasts. This French show problem remained difficult for the islanders until 1904. After local agitation, in 1832, a popularly elected assembly was added in 1855 Newfoundland was granted full responsible government after a campaign that reignited bitter underlying sectarianism. Between 1864 and 1869, Newfoundland was involved in discussions leading to the Canadian Confederation. However, the idea of a confederation was rejected at the polls then and again in 1895. For nearly 150 years, right to the coasts of Labrador, an ill-defined geographic entity, we a hotly debated issue. By 1826 British tribunals had given Newfoundland jurisdiction over the Atlantic face.
Canada of the coasts of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Labrador's inland boundaries and administration remained unsettled until 1927. When Newfoundland was awarded the vast inland region in a definition that said that the coasts reached the headwaters of rivers emptying eastward into the Atlantic Ocean. Following World War II, a national convention was elected to recommend possible forms of future government to be voted on by the people. The convention failed, however, to suggest anything beyond continuing the existing government or returning to the pre-1934 constitution. A referendum held in 1948 gave a clear majority to a confederation with Canada. On March 31, 1949, Newfoundland entered the Canadian Union. Beginning in the 1950s, Newfoundland changed as modern technology transformed industry and the nature of employment. Large fisheries and canneries replaced family-run operations, and a steady migration took place from smaller villages to industrial towns. Chapter 6 The Economy of Newfoundland Historically, the fisheries were the province's chief industry, and until the early 20th century, they were virtually the only activity. Although having diminished significantly as a source of local wealth, the fisheries have remained the primary economic base for hundreds of coastal villages and towns. Modern technology has changed the nature of the fisheries. For centuries the industry revolved around codfish, caught in coastal waters and salted or dried primarily by small family-run facilities for domestic and international markets. Today, while the inshore fishery is still the economic and social backbone of rural Newfoundland and Labrador, the most significant part of the total catch is processed in large plants strategically along the coast. Depleted fish stocks, notably cod, have reduced catches overall, and shellfish have become more important. Secondary processing is assuming an increasingly important role. Agriculture is of little significance. Most of the foodstuffs consumed must be imported. Locally produced agricultural products consist primarily of vegetables, fruits, and livestock and are marketed locally. Newfoundland and Labrador's economy has traditionally been based on exploiting and exporting natural resources. The economy is still resource-oriented although it has become much more diversified. Manufacturing has grown, and service and communications-related activities have become the most important component of the economy. Tourism has expanded significantly in recent years. The mineral resources of Newfoundland and Labrador are significant contributors to the gross provincial product. The growth of mineral production has primarily arisen from the development of Labrador's immense iron ore reserves and, more recently, significant offshore deposits of petroleum and natural gas. Other minerals, such as copper, lead, zinc, gold, asbestos and gypsum are also important. World demand for newsprint and other paper products has encouraged the rapid exploitation of the forests of black spruce. Chapter 6 St. John's St. John's is at the extreme eastern end of Newfoundland and the most easterly city in North America. It is the leading financial and commercial center for Newfoundland. St. John's is the capital of Newfoundland and the largest city in the province. The current population is about 175,000. 
St. John's surrounds a narrow landlocked harbor on the east coast of the Avalon Peninsula. St. John's name is possessive because it is short for St. John's Harbor. The city should not be confused with the city of St. John in the Canadian province of New Brunswick. St. John's has experienced a long and colorful history. Europeans commenced frequenting this harbor around the beginning of the 16th century. Because of its harbor and proximity to the fishing grounds, St. John's has gained prominence as a commercial trading outpost for the Basques French, Spanish, Portuguese and English engaged in the fishery along the western side of the North Atlantic. St. John's is the oldest city founded by Europeans in North America. St. John's is so old that much of its history is steeped in legend. Tradition declares that the city earned its name when explorer John Cabot became the first European to sail into its harbor on June 24, 1497. The feast day of St. John the Baptist. The settlement changed hands several times between France and England until becoming permanently British in 1762. St. John served as a naval base during the American Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. Chapter 4 Signal Hill National Historic Site Newfoundland is the easternmost region of Canada, and St. John's on the Atlantic coast is the most easterly city in North America. The distance between St. John's Newfoundland and Poldhu in Cornwall, England is only 2,117 miles or 3,407 kilometers. This is to be compared to the distance across Canada from St. John's to the Pacific coast at Victoria, B.C., which is 3,146 miles or 5,063 kilometers. The coast-to-coast -coast distance across the U.S. from New York City to San Francisco is 2,566 miles or 4,129 kilometers. As a result of the proximity of St. John's across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe, the region has two important historical distinctions. Guglielmo Marconi received the first transatlantic wireless message at St. John's. On December 12, 1901, at Signal Hill in St. John's, Newfoundland, Guglielmo Marconi listening through his telephone headset heard a series of three beeps, the Morse code for the letter S. Marconi had received the first transatlantic communication, sent from a radio transmitter just over 2,100 miles away, at Poldhu in Cornwall on the southwest coast of England. This painting depicts Marconi's receiving antenna supported by a kite. Note the connecting wire from the antenna went through the window to the receiving apparatus inside, and the ground wire went from the window to the ground. Electrical Engineering Milestone Transatlantic Radio Signals At Signal Hill on December 12, 1901, Guglielmo Marconi and his assistant George Kemp confirmed the reception of the first transatlantic radio signals with a telephone receiver and a wire antenna kept aloft by a kite. They heard Morse code for the letter S transmitted from Poldhu Cornwall. Their experiments showed that radio signals extended far beyond the horizon, giving radio a new global dimension for communication in the 20th century. The first non-stop transatlantic flight was made in 1919 by Captain John Alcock and Lieutenant Arthur Whitton Brown of the United Kingdom in the Vickers Vimy Bombay. 
Alcock and Brown flew from St. John's, Newfoundland, to Clifton, Ireland in 16 hours and 12 minutes, a distance of 2,256 miles or 3,630 kilometers. This postage stamp of 1930 commemorates the first non-stop transatlantic flight in 1919 from St. John's to Ireland. This more recent postage stamp, issued in 1969, commemorates the first non-stop transatlantic flight in 1919 from St. John's to Ireland. During World War II, the harbour at St. John's was used by ships of the Royal Navy, and the Royal Canadian Navy was involved in convoy protection. St. John's was also the site of a large U.S. Army base called Fort Papel. This base was established as part of the Lend-Lease Agreement between the U.K. and the U.S. St. John's retains an old-world charm with its narrow, winding streets similar to those in London and much architecture resembles that found in small Irish towns. This is a view of St. John's. St. John's is also rich in parks and natural areas. Signal Hill and Cape Spear offer spectacular ocean vistas and the opportunity to see whales and icebergs. Cape Spear is North America's most easterly point. This is an iceberg off the coast near St. John's. This is another iceberg off the coast near St. John's. St. John's is the center of the province's business, education and government, with some manufacturing and light industry. St. John's is also the seat of the Roman Catholic Archbishop of St. John's and the Anglican Bishop of Eastern Newfoundland and Labrador. St. John's is the home of the Railway Coastal Museum. Located in the historic Newfoundland Railway Terminal on Water Street. The Railway Coastal Museum has exhibits on the history of the Newfoundland Railway and coastal water transportation in the province. This is the Cabot Tower in St. John's. This is a ship heading out through the Narrows. This is the Government House in St. John's. This is the view from Signal Hill. These are sailboats in the harbor of St. John's. This is a view of St. John's. This is a view of George Street in St. John's. This is downtown shopping in St. John's. This is Duckworth Street in St. John's. This is a view of the harbor area of St. John's. Chapter 7 Gander is a town located in the northeastern part of the island of Newfoundland in the Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Gander is the site of Gander International Airport once an important refueling stop for transatlantic aircraft. The airport is still a preferred emergency landing point for aircraft facing onboard medical or security issues. When the U.S. airspace was closed after the attacks of September 11, 2001, Gander International Airport took in 38 aircraft. It accommodated nearly 6,700 evacuees from Olympic Airways Air France Lufthansa British Airways in Alitalia. Chapter 8 Views of Newfoundland This is Gross Moor National Park on the western coast of Newfoundland. This is Tors Cove on the Avalon Peninsula in Newfoundland. This is the Natchvac Fjord in the Torngat Mountains of Labrador. 
This is the Labrador Sea, as seen from the rocky coast of Labrador. This is Churchill Falls in Labrador. This shows the location of the Goose Bay International Airport. The moose is the most plentiful of the large wild mammals found in Newfoundland, where they outnumber the herds of caribou in Labrador. It is the caribou that are the most numerous. However, the moose and caribou are outnumbered by herds of seals, which migrate along the province's coasts. Other species include the black and polar bears arctic, and red foxes beaver lynx, and the range of small fur-bearing animals common to the northern coniferous forests, and the tundra of northern Labrador. Whales, now protected, are commonly seen throughout the summer as they feed and disport themselves in coastal waters. Vast colonies of seabirds notably Mers Atlantic Puffins, Northern Gannets, Petrels and Eider Ducks, inhabit the offshore islands and headlands. Several species of gulls and terns are ubiquitous, and substantial breeding populations of black ducks and Canada geese are maintained, together with lesser populations of other ducks. Migratory shore and wading birds frequent the coast seasonally. Upland game birds include ptarmigan grouse and snipes, while such birds of prey as the osprey and bald eagle are common. The greater part of Newfoundland and Labrador's people are an extraordinarily homogeneous group. The vast majority trace their origin to the southwestern counties of England or the southwest region of Ireland. A small number trace their ancestry to other English and Irish counties. Scotland, Wales, the Channel Islands or the coasts of Normandy and Breton in France. Virtually all are English speaking. Historically, social groups have been defined along denominational rather than linguistic or ethnic lines. The three principal denominations are Roman Catholic, Anglican and the United Church of Canada. From the beginning of settlement, Newfoundland was a staging point for further emigration. Since the early 20th century, many people have emigrated from the province to the United States and other parts of Canada. Within the province, the trend toward urbanization has been accelerated by government policy intended to reduce the costs of services by centralizing the population. Nearly three-fifths of the population is urban, and about two-fifths live in the metropolitan areas of St. John's and Corner Brook. Chapter 9 The Climate of Newfoundland and Labrador Will it be hot? Or will it be cold in St. John's? Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year in St. John's. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius throughout the year in St. John's. Here is the average monthly precipitation in inches throughout the year in St. John's. The province has cold but not severe winters and warm to cool summers. July mean temperatures. The mean July temperature of the coast ranges from 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 degrees Celsius, in northern Labrador to 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius, on the island's south coast. In the southern interior, the July mean temperature is just above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 degrees Celsius. January mean temperatures. In the southern portion of the island above, it is 20 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 7 degrees Celsius, 
on the coast of Labrador. It is approximately 10 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 12 degrees Celsius, in the south and 0 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 18 degrees Celsius, in the north. The interior of western Labrador is about minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 26 degrees Celsius. Precipitation the annual precipitation varies from 55 inches 1,400 millimeters in the southern parts of the island to about 17 inches 430 millimeters at Cape Chidley. In the northern regions, as much as half of the annual precipitation occurs as snow. In the south, the snowfall usually accounts for only about one-fifth of the total precipitation. Chapter 10 Vineland Leif Erikson, sometimes called Leif the Lucky, is believed by most historians to have been the first explorer to reach the North American mainland. In about the year 1000, Leif Erikson landed at a place he called Vinland. Vinland was identified as Newfoundland in 1963 when archaeologists uncovered the remains of a Viking settlement at the extreme northern tip of Newfoundland. According to the old Viking sagas, nearly 1,000 years ago, Ships from Greenland landed along the coast of North America and established a small settlement. The saga relates that one of Leif's crew, Tyrki the German, straying from the settlement one day, found grapes growing wild in the forest. This was an exciting discovery. One that led Leif to call the new land Vinland, land of wine. Early the following summer, Leif and his crew returned to Greenland. They ship heavily loaded with a cargo of lumber and grapes, probably as wine or raisins. The lumber was of special value to the Greenlanders who had no local timber suitable for building. Chapter 11 El Ansa Meadows Leaf's luck in the new country enticed others to come. The explorers settled for a time at the head of Newfoundland's Great Northern Peninsula, at a place now called Lansa Meadows. We do not know how long they stayed, perhaps only a few years, but they lived here long enough to build substantial houses, several workshops and a small forge where iron was smelted in the New World for the first time. After they left, the buildings decayed, and nature reclaimed the land. Nearly nine centuries later, in 1960, a Norwegian explorer and writer, Helga Ingstad, came upon the site at Lansall Meadows. He was making an intensive search for Norse landing places along the coast, from New England northward, at Lansall Meadows. A local inhabitant, George Decker, led him to a group of overgrown bumps and ridges that looked like they might be building remains. They later proved to be all that was left of that old Viking colony. For the next eight years, Helga and his wife, Archaeologist Ann Steiningstad led an international team of archaeologists from Norway, Iceland, Sweden, and the United States in excavating the site. El Ansa Meadows is now a historical park, with reconstructions of the Viking dwellings. There are Viking artifacts and reconstructed Viking dwellings at Lansa Meadows. Vikings built a small community here, a short distance inland on a narrow gravel terrace by a waterlogged peat bog, close to a small stream. We do not know how long they stayed, perhaps only a few years, but they lived here long enough to build substantial houses. 
several workshops, and a small forge where iron was smelted in the New World for the first time. After they left, the buildings decayed, and nature reclaimed the land. Lansaw Meadows is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the Canadian National Park, called in French, El Deuces, or Jellyfish Cove. Lansaw Meadows is the only authenticated site of Norse settlement in North America. The Norse traveled here around 1000 AD. In 1978 Lansaw Meadows became the first cultural site in the world to be inscribed upon the World Heritage List. The Ingstads found that the overgrown ridges were the lower courses of the walls of eight Norse buildings from the 11th century. The walls and roofs had been of sod, laid over a supporting frame. The buildings were the same as those used in Iceland and Greenland just before and after the year 1000. Long narrow fireplaces in the middle of the floor served for heating, lighting and cooking. Among the ruins of the buildings, excavators unearthed the kind of artifacts found on similar sites in Iceland and Greenland. Inside the cooking pit of one of the large dwellings lay a bronze, ring-headed pin of the kind Norsemen used to fasten their cloaks. Inside another building was a stone oil lamp, and a small spindle whirl, once used as the flywheel of a handheld spindle. In the feet pit of a third dwelling was the fragment of a bone needle believed to have been used for a form of knitting. There was also a small decorated brass fragment that once had been gilded. These finds show that not all the Norse settlers had been men. Spindle whirls and knitting needles were tools used by women. A small whetstone was used to sharpen needles, and small scissors were found near the spindle whirl. It would have also been part of a woman's kit. A great deal of slag from smelting and working of iron was also found on the site, together with many iron boat nails or rivets. More than any other find, archaeologists identified the site as Norse. El Ansom Meadows was where ships could be hauled ashore, looked after and made ready and safe for the long voyage home. The ships were vital to the Norsemen. It was the only link to the homeland. The site was a base and winter camp for people exploring regions farther away from Greenland. Some voyages must have taken them as far south as the St. Lawrence River and parts of New Brunswick. We know this because butternuts were found among the Norse objects. Butternuts have never grown in Newfoundland. Today their northern limit is in northeastern New Brunswick. New Brunswick is also the northern limit for wild grapes. This means that the Norse people who settled at Lonsal Meadows may have found the wild grapes on one of their excursions and decided on the name Vinland. Although Lonsal Meadows is not Vinland as such, Vinland was a country, not a place. This site would have marked the entrance to Vinland, which probably extended to the St. Lawrence River in New Brunswick. The El Ansom Meadows site filled a vital need for a small group of people far away from home and bent on exploring lands even farther away. While most members of the group were free to spend summers farther south, or indeed wherever they liked, enough people must have stayed at Lonsal Meadows to collect food and fuel to support them all during the winter. Not having to return to Greenland for supplies meant they could devote more time to exploring and assembling valuable cargo for resale in Greenland. As winter approached, everyone returned to Lonsaw Meadows, crowding together in the sod houses to celebrate Christmas and tell stories of their adventures. How many years this went on? We do not know. But the remains suggest that it could not have been long. In practical terms, Europe was as close as Vinland and had more to offer. Ultimately Vinland was all but forgot, and along with it, the tiny outpost at Lonsaw Meadows. At the northern entrance to the Strait of Belle Isle, 
within sight of Labrador, and easily reached from all directions. The El Ansa Meadows site filled a vital need for a small group of people far away from home and bent on exploring lands even farther away. While most members of the group we free to spend summers farther south, or indeed wherever they liked, enough people must have stayed at El Ansa Meadows to collect food and fuel to support them all during the winter. Lansa Meadows Chapter 12 Scenes of El Ansa Meadows these are some scenes of El Ansa Meadows. These are some scenes of Lansa Meadows. These are some scenes of El Ansa Meadows. These are some scenes of Lansa 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 Meadows. These are some scenes of El Ansa Meadows. These are some scenes of Lansa Meadows. These are some scenes of El Ansa Meadows. These are some scenes of Lansa 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 Meadows. These are some scenes of El Ansa Meadows. These are some scenes of Lansa Meadows. These are some scenes of El Ansa Meadows. These are some scenes of El Ansa Meadows. These are some scenes of El Ansa Meadows. General References Recommended videos, Newfoundland and Labrador. Recommended videos, Top 5 Best Places to Visit in St. John's. Recommended videos, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada's Divided Province. Recommended videos, Why Did It Take So Long for Newfoundland to Join Canada? Recommended videos, things to do in Newfoundland and Labrador. The Maple Leaf Forever Table of Contents, Newfoundland and Labrador Thanks for watching.